First of all, on behalf of the National Park Service, let me welcome you again to Gettysburg National Military Park. My name is Ranger Carlton Smith, and I'll be with you this afternoon for part of our uh, midwinter lectures. We'll be doing these through the beginning of March. Uh, right now, they're going to be held here in the theater. Uh, the ones in March are going to be held at the Ford Education Centers. Uh, by that time, they start showing the film every 15 minutes, so they need both theaters at that point. Right now, it's only every half hour. That's why we can use one theater. Uh, by the time you get to March, you're going to be showing them every 15 minutes. And the topic today is going to be on General James Longstreet at Appomattox and his famous quote of not yet. Longstreet was wounded on the second day of the Battle of the Wilderness on May 6, 1864. On October 7th, he reports back to Richmond and writes a letter to Lee uh, suggesting he's ready to come back for active duty, but that at least with the Army of Northern Virginia, Lee might want a more vigorous person uh, to take charge. Longstreet is still mostly recovering from his wound. He'll never re recover the use of his right arm. At this point, because of the bullet exiting through his throat, he can't speak above a whisper. But Lee is having none of that. And on October 17th, he orders Longstreet to return and resume command of the, of the First Corps of the Army of Northern Virginia and all the Confederate defenses north of the James River. So Longstreet has everything from Bermuda 100 up towards the Chickahominy. Lee's going to take charge of the defenses around Petersburg itself. By March 29th, the siege of Petersburg has been going on since June 18th of 1864. And Lee's lines at this point run about 37 miles. His last rail link to the south, the South Side Railroad, is going to be controlled by Confederate forces at Five Forks. On April 1st of 1865, Union troops under the command of Phil Sheridan were captured at Five Forks and cut Lee's last rail link to the south. At that point, Lee has no option but to evacuate Richmond and Petersburg. He's going to send orders to Longstreet to bring his troops to Petersburg. Longstreet received Lee's orders about 7 o'clock that night, and within two hours, he has first troops and trained for Petersburg. Longstreet, though, is going to decide to ride on his horse to Petersburg, and he actually arrived there before his troops got there on the trains. Longstreet is going to meet with Lee at Edge Hill, and Edge Hill is just off to the right of this photograph. The marker you see here is for Edge Hill. The main road you see here is West Washington Street, which is Route 1 in Petersburg. So if you're ever going down there, look for Walgreens and you'll find Edge Hill. <laughs> uh, long story short, he arrived at daylight uh, at Edge Hill. But he also wrote that it was still dark when he got there. Now, Silver Twilight was at 527, with full sunrise at 554. Edge Hill is roughly one mile north of Fort Gregg. The federal attack on April 2nd will begin at 515 in the morning. Lee and Longstreet are watching the opening phases of the attack, and Lee appeals to Longstreet to stop the advance. But Longstreet had to admit that not a man of my command was there, nor had we noticed that any of them had reached the station at Petersburg. Because of the federal attack, Lee is forced to evacuate Edge Hill and move to Cartage Farm, the McCowan home, at the intersection of Bowdoin Plank Road and Defense Road. And Defense Road is the road that runs off to the right within shouting distance of battery number 45. Fort Gregg at this point is now a mile west of this location. Longstreet is going to write, not venturing to hope, I looked towards Petersburg and saw General Benning with his rock brigade, windy and rapid march around the near hill. He had but 600 of his men. Benning is Longstreet's leading brigade, and they're going to be positioned to defend the area between Fort Whitworth and the canal near the river. 
Benny himself reported he arrived at Petersburg about 11 o'clock in the morning with two regiments, the 2nd and 15th Georgia. Longstreet also wrote, I, then, I rode then to Benning's line of skirmishers, and at the middle point turned and rode on a walk to the top of the hill, took out my glasses, and had a careful view of the enemy's formidable masses. I thought I recognized General Gibbon and raised my hat, but he was busy and did not see me. Uh, Gibbon at this point having more to do than looking for General Longstreet. But Longstreet's going to establish his new line in the rear of Old Town Creek. The defense of Fort Gregg and Fort Whitworth will buy Lee the time he needs to set up an inner defense line to hold back the Union attack and buy time to organize a retreat. Longstreet's line will run from Battery 45 to the Appomattox River. About 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the rest of Bain's Brigade and Field's Division are taking up position along this new line. General Benning wrote, all was done under the immediate eye of General Longstreet, who rode the coat everywhere, frequently in front of the line, up and down with grand unconcern. I never saw anything like it in the war. It was the talk of all. By 8 o'clock, 8 p.m. of April 2nd, Lee is starting his retreat from Petersburg. He will retreat across the Appomattox River, Longstreet and Hill's Corps were crossed on pontoons at Battersea. Excuse me. Were crossed on the pontoon bridges at Battersea. Benny will claim to be the last of Longstreet's Corps to leave the line at about midnight. The route would take him through Edwick Mills on the north side of the Appomattox River. And Lee is going to be with Longstreet's command. By 3 a.m. of April 3rd, Lee has successfully evacuated the Petersburg Front. And now there's a chase on after Lee. Lee's initial plan is to head for Amelia Courthouse then south through Jetersville to Burkeville, down to Danville, Virginia, and then into North Carolina to join Joe Johnson's army fighting against Sherman. Lee's hoping their combined forces, they can defeat Sherman, turn around, and defeat Grant. It's a long shot, but it's all Lee has at this point. Lieutenant Colonel Erzman Latrobe, one of Longstreet staff officers, will ride to a place called Clover Hill, the home of Kate Cox, an acquaintance of his from Richmond. This is actually the home of Kate's father, Judge John H. Cox, and the judge invites Lee, Longstreet, and their staffs to supper at Clover Hill. Kate is going to help Longstreet cut his food because he's still unable to use his right arm from his wound. Kate also said that Longstreet had little to say on any topic. The Confederates were across a goods bridge between April 3rd and April 4th. Longstreet stayed, I sent across Fields and Wilcox's divisions and took up a line on the south side to cover the crossing of the wagons and artillery, which owing to the heavy character of the roads was very much delayed. Fields' division of Longstreet's command at this point numbers about 5,000 men. It's the largest and most effective division in Lee's army at this point. At Amelia Courthouse, Lee was hoping to find some supplies, and he did. Apparently, there was plenty of artillery ammunition waiting for him, but no food. Somehow, that got mixed up in the orders. And so now, Lee has to spend most of April 4th sending parties out to try to forage for food in the area for his men. That's the best he can do. But also at Amelia Courthouse, Lieutenant Colonel William Miller Owen, of the Warrison Artillery. Remember at this AM, I saw Generals Lee and Longstreet. As usual, they both looked confident. Longstreet himself said, there was considerable skirmishing in my front for a part of the way. And at Amelia Courthouse, I drew Fields, Wilcox's, and Heath's division up in line 
beyond the town and endeavored to bring on an engagement with the enemy. They, however, showed no disposition to attack and withdrew about dark. So here's the guy now, he's recovered from a wound at the wilderness where he was shot by his own men. He's had to retreat from Richmond down to Petersburg. He's retreated now from Petersburg. And yet on April 4th, two days after Petersburg, Longstreet still wants to pitch into the Union troops. He wants to fight them. It's almost like, okay, guys, let's bring it on now. You want to fight? We're ready for you. So Longstreet's not ready to give up by any means. On April 5th, the Confederates are approaching Jetersville. And Longstreet wrote, General Lee was with us at Jetersville, and after careful reconnaissance, thought the enemy's position too strong to warrant aggressive battle. I drew the command off and filed to the right across Flat Creek to march for Farmville. As you can see from the map, when they got to Jetersville, you had Humphrey's Second Corps from the Army of the Potomac, Griffin's Fifth Corps from the Army of the Potomac, Wright's Sixth Corps from the Army of the Potomac, and the cavalry under General Sheridan. That's why Lee chose not to bring on a battle at Jetersville. Meanwhile, at Burkeville Junction, Major General E.O.C. Ord's Army of the James reached the area on the night of April 5th. And on the morning of April 6th, Ward would send a bridge burning party out to burn the high bridge over the Appomattox River and deny it to the Confederates. Meanwhile, early in the morning of April 6th, Longstreet arrives at Rice's Depot, now known simply as Rice, Virginia. His job is to clear the way for the main body of the army and the wagon trains to get through. Longstreet, though, when he gets here, hears about this bridge burning party, which has already passed through Rice's station. Longstreet would take his cavalry commanders, Major General Thomas Earl Rouser and Colonel Thomas Munford, to follow after the bridge burners and capture or destroy the detachment if it took the last man of his command to do it. So Longstreet's after those bridge burners, anything he can. And it's been said that by sending his cavalry array, Longstreet actually increased his own chances of defeat. But he's doing it in order to guarantee Lee's escape with the rest of the army. Longstreet's going to report that General Ord coming up from Burkeville, <coughs> excuse me, drove in my line of skirmishers. But I rode to meet them, marched them back to the line with orders to hold it till called in. But now the Army of Virginia is starting to split. And there's a gap now in the line of the troops trying to retreat. And they're going to split in the bottom land caused by Sailor's Creek. And in that bottom line, part of Lee's army will be attacked by the 6th Corps and Sheridan's Cavalry, where they proceed to capture 8,000 Confederates, almost a third of Lee's army. Their wagon train is crossing over the Appomattox River with John Gordon protecting them. But he's being pressed by the Union Army's 2nd Corps, which is also trying to take advantage of all this. At Rice's station, with Ord not coming on, Longstreet receives orders to move towards Farmville on what he saw was a crowded road deep in mud, with Sheridan fighting against Longstreet's rear guard. This is Longstreet's column, and this is basically Gordon's column with the trains. And here's the high bridge. The Confederate cavalry was able to stop the bridge burners and capture or kill most of them. So the bridge is intact when Gordon starts to cross it. The Confederate engineers have been ordered to burn the high bridge. Now there were actually two bridges in this area. One's the railroad bridge and the other is a wagon bridge. The Confederates did destroy part of the train bridge, which the Union Army quickly rebuilt. But because of the hardwood floors of the wagon bridge that they couldn't burn. And whatever fires they had started, Union infantry came up and put it out. So now Union troops are pouring over the Appomattox River on their wagon bridge at High Bridge. On April 7th, Longstreet will appear in Farmville. 
As he reported, we crossed early in the morning and received two days' rations. Hard on our wagons, made fires, got our cooking utensils, and were just ready to prepare a good breakfast. We had not heard of the disasters on the other route and the hasty retreat, and were looking for a little quiet to prepare breakfast. When General Lee rode up and said that the bridges had been fired before his cavalry crossed, that part of that command was cut off and lost, and that the troops are hurrying on to position at Cumberland Church. Cumberland Church is on the north side of the Appomattox River from Farmville. So Longstreet is crossing this way to get up to Cumberland Church. And he arrives there about 2 o'clock in the afternoon and will help General Mahone hold off attacks from Humphrey's Second Corps. Mahone establishes his headquarters at Cumberland Church itself. And that's also probably where Lee had his headquarters in the same area. At 10 p.m. that night of April 7th, Lee will receive his first note from General Grant. And Grant is proposing that Lee surrender that portion of the Sears Army known as the Army of Northern Virginia. Lee shows that note to some of his staff officers, and he also is going to show it to General Longstreet. Longstreet read the note, handed it back to Lee, and said, not yet. Lee now is going to send his first letter to, to Grant, basing asking what terms Grant will offer if and when Lee feels it's necessary to surrender. Lee's kind of giving himself the option to decide when it's time to do that. He's not going to leave it up entirely to Grant. They're going to start to retreat from Cumberland Church about 11 o'clock in the evening of April 7th. They're going to withdraw towards New Store, and on the way, Gordon's Corps would take the lead, and Longstreet's men would start to bring up the rear. At 10 o'clock in the morning of April 8th, Lee receives Grant's second letter. And in the second letter, Grant basically said, the only condition I have for surrender is that you, the officers and men, shall be disqualified for taking up arms again against the government of the United States until promptly exchanged. Grant Lee now will send his second letter to Longstreet, or excuse me, will send his second letter to Grant. And in this letter, Lee is still not conceding that his army needs to surrender. But he now starts talking to Grant about terms of peace. Not just surrender the army, but overall peace in the country itself. Longstreet reported that on the march, we pass abandoned wagons in flames and limbers and caissons of artillery burning sometimes in the middle of the road. One of my battalion commanders reported his horses too weak to haul his guns. He was ordered to bury the guns and cover their, and cover their burial places with old leaves and brushwood. Longstreet will also issue a general order on April 8th. And, yes, and this general order reminds his division commanders of the standard marching procedure. Hereafter, on all marches, the troops of this command were marched in the manner laid down in the tactics. On all halts, each division will mass on the one in front of it, form its line, and stack arms. Strangling would be prevented by the exercise of every exertion. So even now on April 8th, Longstreet is looking towards the discipline and efficiency of his troops. That's why he's making sure everybody's following the standard marching procedure, even at this point, in everything that's going on. And in the forenoon of April 8th, something really extraordinary from Longstreet's point of view is going to occur. Brigadier General William Pendleton, the chief of artillery for the Army of Northern Virginia, Later on, we report that he approached Longstreet as a messenger from several high-ranking Confederate officers with a proposal, our united judgment that the cause had become so hopeless, we thought it wrong longer to be having men killed on either side, and not right moreover, 
that our beloved commander should be left to bear the entire trial of initiating the idea or terms with the enemy. Now, Pennington later wrote that at first Longstreet dissented, but on second thought, preferred that he himself should be represented with the rest. Now, Pennington would make this statement in 1873. Longstreet is going to be feud in his memoirs in 1898. I've read one historian who felt that because Pennington's account was the earliest, his was the most reliable, and not Longstreet's. The problem is Pennington tells a story in a speech he gave at Washington Lee University on January 19, 1873. It was the same talk in which Pennington accused Longstreet of disobeying Lee's non-attack order here at Gettysburg, which we know never happened. So if you can disprove that, I have questions about this event on April 8th. And I tend to take Longstreet's position more than anything else. Longstreet, as I said, denied this charge. And in his version, much surprised, I turned and asked if he did not know that the Articles of War provide that officers or soldiers who ask commanding officers to surrender should be shot. And said, if General Lee doesn't know when to surrender until I tell him, he will never know. Now, there's another part of this that you don't often hear about. And that is, according to E.P. Alexander, Pendleton came to him after all this. And according to Alexander, Pendleton said, but Longstreet being approached, refused, as Pendleton told it to me. Longstreet said his corps was still able to whip four times their numbers. And as long as that was so, he should never suggest a surrender that he was there to back up Lee, not to pull him down. So Longstreet has some backing here for his account from E.P. Alexander. And what exactly was Longstreet talking about, Pendleton possibly being shot for what he suggested? Now the following regulations come from the regulations for the Army of the Confederate States of America. And except for United States and Confederate States, they're word for word for what's in the United States Army regulations. Article 7, for example, will state, any officer or soldier who shall begin, excite, cause, or join in any mutiny or sedition, in any troop or company the service of the Confederate States, or in any party, post, attachment, or guard, shall suffer death, or such other punishment as by court-martial shall be inflicted. <coughs> Article 59. If any commander of any garrison, fortress, or post shall be compelled by the officers and soldiers under his command to give up to the enemy or to abandon it, the commissioned officers, non-commissioned officers, or soldiers who shall be convicted of having so offended shall suffer death or such other punishment as shall be inflicted upon them by the sentence of a court-martial. In Article 83, it's conduct unbecoming an officer and a gentleman. And back in the Civil War, they did have a nice general article. Article 99, to the prejudice of good order and military discipline. After everything else, you throw this in for good measure. And under today's Uniform Code of Military Justice, Pennington could have been charged with five offenses, including conspiracy, mutiny, subordinate compelling surrender, conduct unbecoming an officer and a gentleman, and the general article. So those articles still left over from the Civil War. But on the night of April 8th, Lee would have a conference with John Brown Gordon, Longstreet, and Fitzhugh Lee. This is going to be Lee's last military conference and they discuss the possibility of breaking out from Appomattox Courthouse. The decision was made to break out of the encircling Union line. Lee believes at this point the only troops in front of him are cavalry. And Gordon's troops, along with Fitzhugh's cavalry, can push them aside, and Lee can continue with his retreat. On the morning of April 9th, Grant was sent off a third letter to Lee at about daybreak. 
And grant this Lord, I have to tell Lee that since he has no authority to treat on the subject of peace, the meeting Lee proposed for April 9th at 10 o'clock could lead to no good. And Grant's going to cancel it. So now Lee knows there's no official meeting with Grant unless he now specifically asks for it. But the battle of Abmax Courthouse will begin at 5 o'clock in the morning of April 9th. Gordon's men are able to clear the Lynchburg Road. And then after pushing out the cavalry, they find it's backed up by a strong force of federal infantry. General Ord's army of the James is approaching, and the Fifth Corps from the Army of the Potomac under Griffin is also approaching. So Gordon's attack is going to be stopped and driven back. At 8 a.m. in the morning, Longstreet is called to Lee's headquarters near an apple tree. According to Longstreet, he, Lee, stood near the embers of some burned rails, received me with graceful salutation, and spoke at once of affairs in front and the loss of his subsistence stores. I asked if the bloody sacrifice of his army could in any way help the cause in other quarters. He thought not. Then I said, your situation speaks for itself. Long as we be in command of the rear guard, is about two miles away from Appomattox Courthouse at Duho Church. And he's confronting Humphrey's 2nd Corps and Wright's 6th Corps from the Army of the Potomac. Longstreet's headquarters had been established in or near Pleasant Retreat. And Pleasant Retreat stood until about 2011. Uh, it was involved in a heavy thunderstorm, windstorm, that blew the back wall of the house out. But the rest of the house was still basically intact. Uh, but the owners decided not to save it. And so if you go looking for a pleasant retreat today, this is what you'll find. The house was demolished. Uh, remember somebody reading that if this had been Lee's headquarters, there would have been a national drive to save it. But because it was long streets, nobody really cared. So that's what you'll find today. Long was going to report, though, that our advanced troops were in action. And General Humphrey was up with the 2nd Corps of the Army of the Potomac, preparing for action against our rear guard. The situation was embarrassing. It was plain enough that I should attack the 2nd Corps before others could be up and prepare for action, though our troops forbade. It could not prevail, however, to call me to quiet while the enemy in plain view was preparing for attack. So we continued our work constructing our best line of defense. General Bain's going to report at Appomattox Courthouse the division was in the rear, with the enemy close up. Its organization was perfect and was not at all demoralized. Not more than four men had been lost to stragglers during the trying march from Petersburg. And I can say almost, if not quite as much, for every brigade in the division. Longstreet's going to report that when strong enough, he ordered parts of the rear guard forward to support the advanced forces and directed General Alexander to establish them with part of his batteries in the best position for support or rallying line in case the front lines were forced back. That was the last line of battle formed in the Army of Northern Virginia. As Gordon's men are falling back through Appomattox Courthouse, they're going to rally on Alexander's line. Lee himself had run towards New Hope Church along the Richmond Lynchburg Road under a flag, he rode through Longstreet's line under a flag of truce because he thought that's where he was going to meet Grant. And that's when his uh, staff officer, Colonel Marshall, received Grant's third letter. And Lee now responds with his third letter. And now Lee is going to state, I now request an interview in accordance with the offer contained in your letter of yesterday for that purpose. Meaning Lee now sees there's no option but to surrender his army of Northern Virginia. But Union skirmishers are approaching where Lee is. Remember, Lee's in between the two lines. 
waiting for some message from Grant to come back. And Union skirmishers are advancing on him. So that's when he has to leave. And he sends a message to General Meade. And Meade sends one back suggesting that Lee write a, a fourth letter to Grant. And this was sent through Sheridan's lines. Because Grant has moved from Lee's rear toward Lee's front. And he's not where Lee was expecting him. So that's why Meade suggests you send another letter through Sheridan's line. It'll get to him a lot quicker. And Lee's fourth letter is now going to state, I therefore request an interview at such time and place as you may designate to discuss the terms of the surrender of this army in accordance with your offer to have such an interview. And then Lee remembers he had not notified Gordon, actually even Longstreet, about truce and suspend hostilities. So now he now authorizes Gordon and Longstreet to send out flags of truce pending the surrender. Longstreet is going to send one of his officers, Captain Robert M. Sims, with a truce flag. And this was really nothing more than a, a white towel that Sims had purchased in Richmond before the retreat. Sims carried the flag to Gordon and informed him of the authorization for a flag of truce. Gordon directs Sims to ride in the direction of Custer's cavalry, which was preparing to assault. Custer is going to receive the flag of truce from Sims. And then Sims returns to Gordon, who wanted Sims to ride in a different direction. But Sims, being Longstreet staff officer, thought he'd better report back to Longstreet. Now coming into the lines with one orderly under his own flag of truce is General Custer. <coughs> and he goes to General Longstreet, who is with Alexander's battle line. And according to Longstreet's account, Custer came riding up and said, in the name of General Sheridan, I demand the unconditional surrender of this army. He was reminded that I was not the commander of the army, that he was within the lines of the enemy without authority, addressing a superior officer and a disrespect to General Grant as well as myself, that if I was the commander of the army, I would not receive the message of General Sheridan. He then became more moderate, saying it would be a pity to have more blood upon that field. Then I suggested that the truce be respected and said, as you are now more reasonable, I will say that General Lee has gone to meet General Grant, and it is for them to determine the future of the armies. He was satisfied and rode back to his command. Now, this is the way Longstreet described it. Other officers who were present uh, paint slightly different pictures. In fact, one account has Longstreet telling Custer Basically, if he wants to attack, uh, Longstreet turned to some of his staff officers and ordered a picket's division, uh, just in case. And when Custer heard that, he decided to back off, at which point uh, Longstreet made the statement that that young man never has learned to play the game of brag, uh, because picket's division didn't exist. <laughs> and this is a, Longstreet's playing poker at this point. Uh, but what I've given you is Longstreet's own account from his memoirs. Now, Custer himself in his first report is merely going to state, driving back as skirmishers, we had almost gained possession of his trains when a staff officer of General Longstreet's came galloping into our line under a flag of truce, requesting a suspension of hostilities. After making a proper disposition of my force, either to repel or make an attack, the truce was agreed to until instructions could be received from the proper authority. Uh, no written evidence from Custer that he rode in Longstreet's line, but all the Confederate officers of Longstreet said he actually did. At 11 o'clock in the morning, jumping ahead here, uh, there's a conference of officers in front of the Appomattox Courthouse on April 9th. One person reported that General Ord, as soon as Longstreet approached, advanced and was introduced to him by General Sheridan. They immediately retired together and had a long and apparently very interesting conversation. 
It was arranged that hostility should not be resumed and no troops be moved from their positions on either side until due and timely notice should be given General Ord by General Longstreet. Among the federal officers at this meeting were Ord, Sheridan, Gibbon, Merritt, Ayers, Griffin, Bartlett, and Crook. And on the Confederate side were Longstreet, Gordon, Heath, Wilcox, and John Fairfax, a member of Longstreet's staff. Lee is going to receive Grant's last letter about 1 o'clock in the afternoon. <coughs> and Grant will inform Lee that your note of this date is but this moment at 11.50 received. He told Lee where he was located and that he was pushed forward to the front for the purpose of meeting you. And Grant said, if you send a message down along this road, they'll meet me, and I'll know where to meet you. Lee and Longstreet are back at the apple tree site. They're talking about these various messages from Grant when a flag of truce comes up with a federal officer to take Lee into Appomattox Courthouse for the meeting with Grant. And as Lee's getting ready to ride away, Longstreet remembered I assured him that I knew General Grant well enough to say that the terms would be such as he would demand under similar circumstances, but he yet had doubts. The conversation continued in broken sentences until the bearer of the return dispatch approached. As he still seemed apprehensive of humiliating demands, I suggested that in that event, he should break off the interview and tell General Grant to do his worst. So here, while Lee's riding up to discuss surrender, Longstreet's telling him, if you don't get good terms from Grant, I again tell him to come on and give, give us everything he's got, and we'll meet him on the field of battle then, and settle so things that way. So Longstreet is still, if the, next, if the situation requires it, it's going to be very aggressive if he has to be. Of course, we all know what's going to happen next. Lee will meet with Grant at the McLean House and Appomattox Courthouse and surrender the Army of Northern Virginia. Longstreet is going to report that as Lee is riding from the surrender back towards his lines, from force of habit, a burst of salutations greeted him, but it quietly, but it quieted as suddenly as it arose. The road was packed by standing troops as he approached, the men with hats off, heads and hearts bowed down. As he passed, they raised their heads and looked upon him with swimming eyes. Those who could find voice said goodbye. Those who could not speak and were near passed their hands over the sides of Traveler. He rode with his hat off and had sufficient control to fix his eye on a line between the ears of Traveler and looked neither to right nor left until he reached a large white oak tree we dismounted to make his last headquarters and finally talked a little. Longs is going to report that soon after General Lee's return ride, his chief of ordnance reported a large amount of United States currency in his possession. In doubt as to the proper disposition of the funds, General Lee sent the officer to ask my opinion. As it was not known or included in conditions of capitulation, and was due, and ten times more, to the faithful troops, I suggested a pro rata distribution of it. The officer afterwards brought $300 as my part. I took $100 and asked to have the balance distributed among Field's division, the troops most distant from their homes. Keep in mind, one of the brigades in Field's division is the Texas Brigade. So those guys have a long way to go, to get back home. On April 10th, Longstreet's going to order his men to stack their arms in the fields across from where they're bivouacking, and that was to avoid any conflicts with visiting federal officers or soldiers. General Meade, General Meade is going to write that among others, he met Lee and Longstreet and many old friends from the old army. Lee and Grant had agreed to appoint three commissioners each to work out the actual surrender details. 
On the Confederate side will be Longstreet, John Gordon, and William Pendleton. On the northern side will be John Griffin, excuse me, John Gibbon, Charles Griffin, and Wesley Merritt. Colonel Charles Rainwright is also going to report that at Clove Hill Tavern, I saw Longstreet, Pickett, Gordon, Heath, and a number of their other generals on April 10th. Longstreet is also going to report that at the McLean House, where the commissioners were meeting, Grant had temporary headquarters set up in the surrender room. As I was passing through the room as one of the commissioners, General Grant looked up, recognized me, rose, and with his old-time cheerful greeting, gave me his hand, and after passing a few remarks, offered a cigar, which was gratefully received. Grant himself simply wrote, Here the officers seemed to enjoy the meeting as much as though they had been friends separated for a long time while fighting battles under the same flag. After an hour pleasantly passed in this way, I set out on horseback. So Grant set out on horseback and suddenly finally reminded him that he hadn't told the Secretary of War about the surrender. So Grant wrote a message to Secretary Stanton informing him of what had gone on. John Gibbon, in his accounts of the surrender proceedings, said that John Gordon started making a speech. Uh, because the Federalists had been so liberal, Gordon felt it is his personal honor that the Confederates should give liberal interpretation to every question. Gibbon said Longstreet sat still and said nothing. But when Gordon sat down, he remarked very quietly that he would pose a surrender should include all troops belonging to the army except such cavalry as actually made its escape and any artillery that was beyond 20 miles from Appomattox Courthouse at the time of the surrender. This proposition was at once accepted by unanimous consent. One of Longstreet's staff officers, Captain T.J. Gorey from Texas, uh, reported that he had decided to go home via New York, New Orleans, and Galveston. I was encouraged to do this, too, by General Longstreet, who had decided to go to Texas and propose this route for himself. Lee would break up his headquarters on April 11th. But before riding off, he's going to say farewell to some of his officers. Again, Captain Gord is going to write, while General Lee was about to take his departure for Richmond, a great many of his old officers called his headquarters to bid him goodbye. As General Lee passed around, he had some pleasant remark to make to each one whom he bid goodbye. I was standing next to General Longstreet, and he warmly embraced the general and then turning to me and shaking my hand said, Captain, I'm going to put my old war horse under your charge. I want you to take good care of him. The final surrender of Lee's army would take place on April 12th. The federal soldiers would be standing at shoulder arms and silent. Longstreet's command would be the last to surrender at Appomattox. There's no evidence that Longstreet himself was at the surrender site. But after all this is over, Longstreet is going to leave Appomattox. He arrived in Lynchburg, Virginia on April 14th. That's where his family was staying. They had gone to stay there with relatives. And on June 1st of 1865, General, former General James Longstreet will welcome James Longstreet Jr., one of his children. And to, to give you an idea of how confusing things can get in a war, especially towards the end of it, on May 12, 1865, Colonel W.H. Dickey sent a message to Captain W.H. Clapp from Bayou Sierra in Louisiana. He wrote, Jeff Davis, Breckenridge, Benjamin, Trenholm, and other prominent officers of the Confederate government crossed the river Mississippi one week ago today, 13 miles above Fort Adams. Lieutenant General Longstreet accompanies them. There is no doubt whatever the truth of this information. Now, this message was sent on May 12th. 
Davis was captured May 10th in Georgia, nowhere near the Mississippi. And Longstreet himself was still back in Virginia. So things can get a little confusing towards the end of a war. And actually on May 24th, Longstreet asked permission to visit Washington, D.C. on important private business. And on May 25th, Longstreet would take the oath, would take the amnesty oath. But he was accepted by the president's proclamation. And he's referring to Lincoln's proclamation of amnesty and reconstruction of December 8, 1863. Pardoning those who directly or by implication participated in the existing rebellion. The exceptions included high-ranking military officers and all who resigned commissions in the U.S. Army and Navy to join the Confederacy, both of which apply to James Longstreet. Longstreet would finally be granted his pardon in June of 1867, and all political disabilities are removed by act of Congress on June 24th, of 1868. Longstreet is going to leave Lynchburg on June 26, 1865. Accompanying him will be his aide, Captain T.J. Gorey, his son, John Garland, and Jim, a Negro servant. They arrived at the general's brother's house, William Longstreet, near Cleveland, Georgia, on July 13th. And while Longstreet proceeded to climb 3,000 foot, Mount Yona. Now, Mount Yona is not the highest point in Georgia. It's not even in the top 10, but it is pretty rugged. Uh, today, it's known for rock climbing, as you can see from the summit here. There's also today a two and a half mile walking trail up to the summit. But of course, in 1865, they didn't have any of that. So here, and, and people have questioned why General Longstreet chose to climb this mountain to begin with. And some people see that just after four years of war and after Appomattox and everything else, the general needed some type of challenge to meet. And this was his challenge to climb the mountain. Now, granted, he's not climbing the Matterhorn or anything like that, but it's not an easy ascent. In fact, Captain Gorey went up with him, so we had a fine, extensive view of the surrounding country. But the ascent was so tiresome and difficult that we were so exhausted when we reached the summit as not to be able to enjoy it to the fullest extent. In the post-war years, because of the pardon and the disabilities being released, Longstreet's gonna go back to serving his country. Keep in mind, Longstreet lived from 1821 to 1904. He died just two days short of his 84th birthday. And in that time, he had graduated from West Point, served his country in the Mexican War, served as a lieutenant general of the Confederate Army for the Civil War, and then afterwards served his country again as Survey of Customs in New Orleans, Postmaster of Gainesville, Georgia, U.S. Marshal to Georgia, Minister to Turkey, and in his life as a U.S. Railroad Commissioner, where he replaced Wade Hampton, another former Confederate general. But Longstreet, in, in trying to sum up the Appomattox campaign, is going to state the difficulties which my troops labored under in this campaign were very great. From the time we left Richmond until we reached Farmville, they were entirely out of rations and had to find a subsistence in any way they could. Continuous night marching along roads and coming with wagons had very much to fatigue them. They submitted most cheerfully to all these privations and maintained throughout that soldierly spirit which distinguishes them. I want to thank you folks for joining me this afternoon. Uh, does anybody have any questions at this point about anything I've talked about? Thank you. Yes, sir. You mean this one? Yeah. Is, that, is there a chance that they had some that were like women's? You know what I mean? You know, I, I had a friend of mine one time look at this, uh, blow a picture like this. This is one of the most famous photographs of Longstreet. It's always this way. It's always this way. 
And in the blow-ups, she thought that what you saw, what you're seeing here, she says that's actually what war looks like when it's been repaired. That's what I was told. Okay. But I'm just um, saying is that it seems odd that some would be backwards. This picture is backwards. The picture is backwards? Yes. Okay. okay. Keep it, and, and somebody, and, and actually Matt just pointed out the other week, uh, Longstreet's got a button, not buttoned here. So either the button is missing, or he said there might be another picture like this with Longstreet in that famous Napoleonic pose with his hand inside his jacket. And he just hasn't buttoned it afterwards. Uh, so two possibilities, either that, there's a missing picture, or Longstreet's missing a button for some reason. Most of them, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes, do you have any sense of who was involved with Pendleton in that request to ask to try to get Lee to surrender? The only people Pendleton mentions are Longstreet and John B. Gordon. And both Gordon and Longstreet denied they had anything to do with it. <laughs> yeah. Now, and again, both their comments are written years after Pendleton's speech. Uh, but as I mentioned, there's good reason to doubt Pendleton's ferocity in what he's saying. So I tend to go along with Longstreet. Yes, sir? I was surprised to hear that General Pickett was at Appomattox. I, I just hadn't thought too much about it. Wasn't he relieved by Lee earlier? What, what happened, there's a story that, that Lee, at some point on the retreat, I don't remember the exact date, saw Pickett and one or two other officers. Uh, and his comment was he, he didn't know that man was still with the army. Uh, Pickett's division basically didn't exist anymore. And so people cite that as an example of even Lee looking towards the efficiency of his army. Now, I, I don't know for sure if Pickett was physically at Appomattox or not. Uh, like I said, the one account given of Longstreet and Custer is Longstreet ordered a Pickett's division, which Custer didn't know didn't exist. So I'm not sure if, Custer, if Pickett was at Appomattox or not. Yes? Where did the name Appomattox come from? Uh, it's, it's Appomattox Courthouse was uh, the county seat for Appomattox, Virginia. Uh, I think it's an old Indian term. Exactly what it means, I couldn't tell you. That's what I was wondering. I mean, it's very yeah. Yeah. Yes. What are the circumstances surrounding his uh, wounding by his own troops? Oh, Longstreet's wounded by his own men. Uh, Longstreet came on the field with the woundedness on the morning of May 6th, the second day of the battle. Uh, Lee's right flank is basically being destroyed. At that point, the whole army's in danger of destruction. Longstreet's guys come up right at the, at the right time. Not only stop the Union advance, but drive it back. Longstreet then found a route to attack the Union flank, and that starts to collapse the Union line. And Longstreet wants to continue that attack because he's found another way to attack the flank. So he can do it twice. And, but of course, in that situation, there's a lot of confusion. He's got some troops on the road, uh, some troops on the south side of the road, and one of the regiments from... Uh, Mahone's brigade got on the other side, on the north side of the road from Longstreet and his men. They fired a few shots, and then a volley came for the regiments on the south side of the road. And Longstreet and his men are in the middle. His staff. He got hit by friendly fire. Uh, the bullet probably entered right below the right shoulder, traveled up and to the left, and exited out the throat. And Longstreet was pretty lucky to survive. Probably the only thing that saved him was his size. He was about six feet two and weighed about 200 pounds. And not a, not a fat guy. He was just a big guy. And that's probably what saved him. Uh, they were able to staunch the flow of blood in his throat. Uh, but because of the way the bullet went, it severed the nerves to his right arm. That's why he was never able to use it. And actually went through his voice box. 
And that's why before the wilderness, uh, Longstreet's voice could be heard all along the battle line. And after that, he, can, he could never speak above a whisper. Uh, by 1904, uh, among other things, Longstreet now had developed pneumonia, and all that coughing reopened the old throat wound. And that's, that was part of the cause of his death in 1904. Uh, he had actually just come back from Chicago for x-ray treatment of cancer to his eye. And suppose that treatment was successful. So he was still pretty tough at the age of 84. Had lost a lot of weight. I mean, he, wasn't, he was no longer 200 pounds, uh, but he was still getting around, still serving as a railroad commissioner. Uh, in fact, in 1902, he and his wife had taken a trip uh, out to Colorado, I think. So, yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, I want to thank everybody for joining me today. <laughs> <laughs>